Family is our great mediating institution. And when we saw the news this week from the CDC that fertility rates were at an all-time low, we realized that this had implications not just for our communities and the economy, but also for what it means to be human in 21st century America. And so at the Deseret News, we curated a panel of researchers and thinkers and writers to help us understand how we got here. Bethany Mendel, a contributing writer to the Deseret News, is going to lead today's panel. Thank you for joining us. Hello and welcome to this Deseret News event discussion on the plummeting birth rate. We've assembled a remarkable group of experts to discuss the CDC's recent findings, the worst fertility news we've ever seen in this country. We've had a record low birth rate in the United States, 1.64 babies per American woman. And we're well below the necessary replacement rate of 2.1 births per woman. While this latest drastic drop is certainly due to the medical and financial insecurity that a once in a lifetime pandemic brings, unfortunately, the fact that our birth rate has plummeted cannot just be part of the COVID story alone. We are honored to have these distinguished panelists with us today to unpack this issue. First, we have Lyman Stone. He's an adjunct fellow at AEI, a research fellow at the Institute for Family Studies, and a former international economist at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, where he forecasts cotton market conditions. I'm interested to see how you link those together, if you can. That'll be like a bonus question. He blogs on migration, population dynamics, and regional economics at in a state of migration. He also writes regularly for Vox's Big Idea Vertical and for The Federalist. His work has been covered in The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, and numerous other local outlets. Thank you so much for joining us, Lyman. Valerie Hudson is a professor and a George H.W. Bush chair at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M. She has previously taught at Brigham Young, Northwestern, and Rutgers Universities. Her research is focused on foreign policy analysis, security studies, gender and international relations, and methodology. And Lois Collin is an award-winning journalist covering family issues with Deseret News in-depth team. Thank you all for joining us today for this conversation on birth and why more people aren't doing it. Uh, so I wanted to first address this question to Lois, because I, th I think that your piece in Deseret was sort of a really great big picture um, look at this issue. And and what what is sort of the big picture? So women aren't having enough babies. Families aren't having enough babies. What does this mean for American society in general um, if, if this continues, society at large? Is this just sort of smaller family reunions or is there more to it? Well, when I first started covering this issue, I didn't know a lot about it at all. I just thought it was really that simple. I can have two kids or no kids and who cares? But as I've talked to experts like Lyman and like Valerie, I've come to see that it's a much bigger problem than that, that affects our whole future as a country. So there was a prediction going into COVID that that the birth rate would actually climb up because people would be at home, they'd have more time, they'd be spending less time commuting, they would be more, just sort of more connected to family, couples connected to each other in, in more intimate ways that would kind of promote thinking about these things. And it just didn't happen. It didn't happen at all. They, the birth rate plummeted more last year than in previous years. Um, we're now less than 56 per 1,000 women of childbearing age as far as births go. And the impacts touch everything. I think it's going to be a major problem that I hadn't understood from whether you can sell your house in the future to what happens to education, what it does to the economy. And I think that people really need to figure out how to connect these dots. So as far as housing and education and, and all of these sort of bigger programs that, that the government runs, what will it mean for me personally if no one else around me is having babies? What, how will that impact me personally? I would defer to Lyman on this because a lot of what I know on this is stuff that I learned from Lyman, but it's, it's kind of a scary potential picture. Okay. So Lyman, jump in. What, what does this look like? I, I only, I'm a narcissist. I only care about myself. I don't care if anyone else has babies because I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm holding up my end of the bargain, but how does this impact me personally? So there's kind of two levels on which uh, fertility rates can impact an individual person. Uh, one is what we call the, the sort of the internal level, and the other is sort of an external. So the internal is, problem is not just 
that birth rates are low. You know, what does it even mean to be low? They're higher than in some countries. They're lower and lower than in other countries, right? The problem is that birth rates right now in the U.S. are lower than what people, and particularly women of reproductive age, say they want for themselves, right? So that right there points to one of the things this is going to mean to you is that odds are that you may not have the family that, that you want to have. You may have gotten married later than you wanted to get married. You may have had children later than you wanted to have children. You may have had fewer children in total. Uh, and you may have fewer healthy years of life uh, enjoying those relationships. Um, and of course, uh, and of course, enjoying relationships with uh, mature grandchildren as well. So like one of the things that this means is just like people aren't getting what they say they want. Like point blank, that's, that's a cost. Um, but then there's the external effect. If everybody has fewer children, then you know, when you buy a house, uh, the value of that house is contingent on other people being around who want to buy it. Now, because of migration, there will always be some markets that are hot and some markets that are not. But when the overall population in the nation is growing slower or eventually possibly even declining, although we're not there yet, the share of markets that are not hot will get bigger. The share of markets that are hot will get smaller, right? Because uh, you can reshuffle people around to get some hot markets, but there's just going to be natural gravity there. And the whole economy works like this. Almost every, almost every savings vehicle that we have actually rests on intergenerational transfers. So what you need to think of for a low population growth economy is an economy uh, where the returns to saving are very low. And so to get ahead in life, you have to start working earlier and stay working longer and probably work more hours um, because your savings are just not going to accumulate at the same rate. So Valerie, I wanted to ask you, so Lyman's painting a not great picture of, of the future of American economy, the future of American society, and, and Lois's as well. Are we alone in this? Are we the only folks, especially this year, the pandemic has sort of hit everyone around the world in, in an unequal way? Um, I have two separate questions that are that are somewhat linked. One is, it, it seems in 2020, we saw a really significant drop. Was this related to COVID? Um, in comparison to um, America that I think I, I think we can argue got hit pretty hard, some countries didn't get hit as hard. Did their fertility rates drop at the same rate? I'm glad you asked the question uh, in a comparative sense because um, we are absolutely not alone in having our birth rates drop. Uh, and this is not simply because of the pandemic. Even the birth rates before the pandemic hit um, were on the downward trajectory, and we were certainly sub-replacement uh, well before the lockdown hit. But that's also true of the majority of countries in the world. I mean, you would be surprised to find uh, that uh, even countries that have really amazing uh, social support for mothers, such as Sweden and Norway and Finland and others, um, some of them have worse birth rates than we do. Wow. Uh, and, and this is something that's, that's really not, hasn't been part of the discussion. And I really think it needs to be part of the discussion because if you're looking at solutions, then clearly simply throwing social support at mothers or simply as Russia does throwing mother or money, you know, uh, big wads of money at mothers is not working. Uh, Russia's birth rate is far lower than ours. Um, so when we talk about solutions, I think it's a different kettle of fish. China just recorded the worst birth rate since 1961 when it was in the middle of a famine, for goodness sakes. And this uh, actually has a lot of interesting international implications. How do you become the world hegemon when your population is falling, dropping like a rock? How does a nation like Japan whose birth rate is so low, it's incredible. Or Taiwan, which has the lowest recorded birth rate in the world. What is that going to say in terms of international affairs as, as China rises, uh, but uh, Japan and uh, Taiwan are actually even more swiftly depopulating than, um, than China is. 
and I hope you'll get back to me at some point, that what we need to talk about is not simply social support, but we need to ask ourselves why social support does not work, or at least hasn't been working. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I've i been following this story out of Japan for many years, The the what the birth rate has meant for every facet of their society. And I, I think it's fascinating. I was in Korea, I, I think three years ago, and, and I had really sort of crazy conversations with folks when I told them how many kids I had, they were just blown, blown away, like we were the Duggars. Um, but <laughs> and my question is, are we on the same path as Japan? Are we headed that way? Because that's a, that's a scary prospect. Yeah, I believe we are. Absolutely. Wow. So I think like we need to step back and talk about the social trends that are, are moving this in that direction. Lyman, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, no, I agree. In fact, it's not just that we're headed the way of Japan, but our, our birth rate in 2020 was about the same as the birth rate in the late 80s in Japan that sort of set off this whole discourse of like Japanification. Now, the interesting thing, though, is today Japan has the highest fertility rate in East Asia other than the nomads of Mongolia. Um, now, we still think of it as low uh, because it's about 1.4. Uh, which is lower than ours, but China, Taiwan, Korea, they're all, Singapore, Hong Kong, they're all lower. Um, so Japan is actually, in some sense, the optimistic outcome. Interesting. Um, you kind of get to like 1.4 and then you kind of like chug along. Um, the scary one is, is like Taiwan, Korea, or China, where you get to like one. However, I do think it's important to think critically about the role of policy because um, Valerie's totally correct that a lot of countries with way more generous social support for families have uh, as low or lower fertility than we do. It's totally true. However, we also know that the main drivers of fertility aren't policy at all, right? They're cultural attitudes, values, sort of broader socioeconomic development. And those things also vary internationally. So for example, within Finland or Sweden, if you look at Lestadi and Lutherans, they have like six kids on average each, right? Um, Israel has very high fertility. One reason is the presence of the ultra-Orthodox. Now, secular Jews also in Israel have rather high fertility. But mm -hmm. so I think when we think about policy, we have to control for the fact that the histories and cultural backgrounds and broader socioeconomic conditions facing each country vary even more than their policy does. In fact, policy is often the smallest source of variation across countries. Interesting. When we do so, that is when we look at what happens when countries implement a new policy, like a new child allowance or, or, some, or a parental leave, it does reliably increase fertility. There's about 50 empirical studies of this that I've found. They almost all find positive effects. The effects aren't huge, buying your way to replacement rate fertility would be phenomenally expensive. Um, but they are, they are real. They are positive. They do exist. Um, so I think when we think about policy, we shouldn't say it doesn't work. We should say uh, it's, it's probably not effective to try and get to replacement rate only through social support. So I wanted to make you rewind also to this sort of cultural question because you had a fantastic piece in the Atlantic that Tim Carney, I don't know if you got the Google alert, but he just clicked publish that he just wrote about it also for the for the Washington Examiner. And he he mentioned your piece in the Atlantic about workism. Uh, I, I thought that that was a fascinating question and one that sort of rang true for me personally. Can you sort of delve more into what workism and workaholism and how that's impacting our fertility worldwide and nationwide? So me and a, and a co-author um, uh, as well, um, Lori DeRose at uh, Catholic University of America, wrote this report about workism, which is basically the, the extent to which people derive their meaning and value in life from work. And I have to say this, this report really stems from an extremely scientific uh, exercise of, uh, I was watching Elf and I thought, Wow, this is actually sort of an interesting like paradigm of of like family dynamics is like what effect does being super work focused have on your fertility um and then Lori was really interested in well what not just at the individual level at the societal level what effect does a society where everybody really really values work lie have? and what we found is at the individual and at the societal level 
across four different data sets covering almost half a million survey respondents in 100 countries over 40 years. So we have a lot of different data in here. Um, people who value work more highly, uh, people, I should say people in high, high income countries who value work more highly um, tend to have fewer children. And when high income countries become more workist, uh, their fertility rates decline even among people who personally value work rather highly, or rather, rather low, I mean, um, which is to say there is an individual and a contextual effect. When people get their meaning from work, when life becomes about work, family suffers. So this is an attitude that we see growing. Uh, in our view, um, this sort of, I get my meaning in life from my meaningful career, I want to do something that really makes the world better. These kinds of statements um, uh, are probably representing a kind of cultural shift about work that, uh, that leads to lower fertility. Because from a child's perspective, what is the greatest competition for the emotional and mental energy of a parent? Work. And from a parent's perspective, what is the thing that prevents you from doing the fun parts of being a parent? That is you know, being at the t-ball game or whatever. It's work. That is, work provides an alternative source of utility in the meaning-making function, and it also diminishes the utility that you derive from parenting when you are overworked or when you um, have this strong work competition. I should say this is not just about women. We actually found this effect was bigger for men than it was for women. So it is not just like, oh, women entering the work. This effect, if we if we only look at men, this effect still shows up. So Valerie, we've been talking a lot about sort of the negative aspects of, of this. And in my perception, and please feel free to correct me, but it feels like East Asia is sort of a little bit of head there. We're looking into the future of this low birth rate as far as where where we're headed. So we've been talking about the negatives. Are there any positives? Is there anything good that, that we can say about the fact that people are having fewer kids in these countries? I know maybe maybe this is just me trying to be an optimist where there is no optimism. That's an interesting question. Um, obviously, uh, for workers in these countries, there are some positives. Um, Chinese employers are now having to pay their employees a higher wage in order to attract. Uh, any sort of competent workers. So as your, your workforce shrinks, obviously uh, labor has a little bit of advantage in terms of negotiation uh, and leverage. Uh, certainly uh, you could point to other things in terms of uh, women's achievements and, and so forth. But you know, on the whole, I, I don't know of any nation that sees uh, you know, such a steep decline in birth rates as uh, overall a, a positive thing for the entire society, though I think we would agree that there are subgroups that would, that would benefit from it. I think one of the things that you know, hasn't been raised yet is uh, you know, not just the, the policy or the social support, but also that um, you know, the women of the entire world um, now face a very different situation um, concerning the men with whom they are supposed to partner and marry and have children. Um, I speak to students all the time who say that I, I can't even find a man who is not uh, getting off on porn every day of the week. And we know from recent studies that this porn use is associated with far less interest in actual real sexual relations with anyone. Um, as, as well as a, a, a lessened interest in making a commitment, marrying, having children, and so forth. So uh, our, our girls, right, uh, our, our young women, as uh, Lyman put it, are having fewer children than they would like. But that's because, I think, they are looking at the type of marriage and the type of partners and they're saying, this is not really a good bet at all. You can see this most clearly in Japan, to which you alluded to before, which is that um, Japanese women would like more children, um, but uh, the, the type of, of marriage, right? How, how marriage is defined in Japan is completely one-sided with huge and immense burdens on the wife. And what, 
rational woman in Japan in, in a context where she's fully able to support herself without marriage would say, sign me up for that. <laughs> so I, I, I do think that we're entering into a period of time in which whole cultures have to basically renegotiate right? The, the, the terms of engagement uh, between men and women. And women are already signaling, right, that they are unhappy with the current terms of engagement. I think it's reflected in fertility. Rate. Can I jump in for just a second, Bethany? You, asked, you asked about whether or not um, there was anybody who benefited from this. And I've had two or three demographers over the years tell me that one, one benefit and it doesn't outweigh the negatives, but one benefit is that the children, when there are fewer children, tend to get more attention. They, they tend to have more focus and more resources put into them. And so on an individual level, um, what's bad for society may be good for some of these kids in that way, but it's, it's tricky. And, it's, and I think one of the biggest problems is just that people are not connecting the dots. So I say, okay, I'm, I'm 62 years old next week. I'm settled? Why am I paying for schools? Why am I worried about these things? What is, you know, how does this impact me? Well, it impacts me in 50 ways if I can connect the dots. And I don't think people are doing that. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, as far as sort of solutions go, I, I had a, and maybe, a, and I don't think it is a solution, but I think as I'm veering our conversation in that direction, the only reason that our population is not declining is because we have enough immigration um, that we're able to sort of buoy ourselves. Um, what does this do? And I think this this question might be for Valerie, but really, I just want to open it up to anyone. Um, what does this do to sort of cultures around the world if everyone is relying on immigration and and where is that immigration coming from? How many how many people are there in the developing world that we can use to sort of buoy all of the, the populations of, of countries like ours in the first world? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I think it's a very interesting question. Um, for example, take Mexico. Mexico is right at um, replacement rate and it's um, projected to drop below replacement rate. So the population of Mexico will actually be shrinking in the future. And right now its population is static. Um, so you, you are right, if you're looking um, for migrants, um, increasingly you, you'd have to be looking much further afield for migrants. And you still have a fairly high fertility in North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa uh, primarily, but even places like India. Uh, India's um, uh, birth rate is about 2.3, right, with replacement being 2.1. Um, so I agree that this is something that definitely uh, requires some scholarly uh, attention from our demographers, which is uh, if immigration is your uh, fix. And for some countries, it isn't, right? Japan, South Korea, they are not willing to fix their problems with immigration. But for those countries that are open to that, increasingly, I think you're going to see that uh, there, there aren't lots and lots of countries having lots and lots of children. Bangladesh is exactly at replacement rate now, too. Bangladesh, yes. It's worth noting they're actually below because in those countries, they also have higher child mortality. So their true replacement rate is actually closer to like 2.2, 2.3, 2 2.4. Wow. Um, that is to account for those, those children who died. It's, they are below. Um, I mean, I think those are, it's, it's important to think about this, right? That the U.S., the immigration rate into the U.S. has been declining for 40 years. Um, uh, some in other countries are opening up. So like Korea is still not really opening up to immigrants, but Japan now their annual net migration rate is, uh, is almost as high or higher than the U S is now. Um, now they don't really provide access to citizenship, but they'll, they'll bring people in to work. Um, uh, but the issue is that, you know, the U.S. can prop up its population with immigration for a while, but even if you account for our immigration rates, our immigration adjusted replacement rate, that is how many babies we'd need to have for a stable population in the long run at current rates of immigration is about 1.8.
In 2020, we had 1.64. <laughs> so even accounting for immigration in the long run, decline eventually sets in at these rates of birth. Um, so so I, I think immigration, I love it. It's great. I want more of it. Um, but it's not, it's, it's not, uh, it's not a per, it's not, it's not actually going to solve this problem. And in the process, you have countries that are transitioning very rapidly, like India or Bangladesh, that are getting very small child cohorts at a time when their income levels are still very low, which is to say they will have very large numbers of retirees in a few decades at a time when they don't have the resources to support them. Stripping off more of their prime age workers, and especially the most talented ones, to move to the US to prop up our sinking ship just makes their sinking ship sink even faster. And I have to inform you, when India goes down, it's a lot more human lives lost than when America goes down, about four times as many. So like ethically, there's a concern here about like, oh, we're just gonna take all the immigrants from all the other countries that have the same problem, but worse. Um, I want immigration, believe it's important, it's valuable, and it's, I think, essential to a vision of what American society is, to be welcoming to immigrants. But it's not welcoming to immigrants to leave the societies they came from where they still have family in Iraq, to invite them into a society where they're not going to achieve the family life that they themselves want. So I've read that, um, and, and Lois, maybe, maybe you have the answer to this, or, or Lyman, I'm not sure, but a, a lot of the explanation for why our birth rate has gone down to the, the depths that it has is because the folks, the, the immigrants that we've had come here in the past are mirroring, mirroring the birth rate of the, the people who were already here. And so the, the sort of Hispanic immigrants who a generation ago were having more kids are now sort of matching um, matching the, the lower fertility of, of the people who are around them. Is that, is that to blame for, for some of our numbers? I don't know that you could say it's to blame, but it contributes. And part of that is just natural assimilation, yeah. just kind of doing what's done around you. And the other thing that really strikes me about this is when we talk about like workism and about these numbers, we have sent the message that that college is important and it is important for a lot of people, but that puts you back four years unless you're going to try to juggle school and, and having kids and, and getting married and all these things. And, and we've made, as Lyman said, work really, really important. And, you know, I'm kind of a workist. I don't apologize for caring about my career and wanting to make a difference and in, in my chosen field. But it's a balance. I'm also a mother. And how do I juggle that? And I think that culturally, we have kind of made people feel like there's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things and a right order to do things. And, um, and unfortunately, it has not been real fertile friendly. It just hasn't. It's not been about fertility. It's been about figuring out who you are and getting your career and launching yourself and doing all these things. And I just think that we have to kind of figure this out. It's going to be, I worry, I have kids that are in their twenties now and I worry about what's going to happen. Will they have to work until they're 85 to support, you know, to, to support the world that we want to have or to build the economy or all these things. And like I said, I'm older, I'm going to escape this at some point without suffering some of the dire future effects, but you guys aren't, you're a lot younger than me. So good luck with that. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> So what I, I kind of want to ask this to you as as a mother and a reporter who has a lot of sort of micro interactions for the folks that are around you, the, the subjects of your pieces and, and your kids and their friends and everything. As far as we're looking at solutions, what could encourage higher birth rates among the individuals that you sort of have been speaking to about this topic? So I think one of the things, and it seems really stupid, is to just be more accepting of different paths for people. To not, you know, I've, I've done a lot of writing about the, the college pipeline and how important it is, but I've also done a lot of writing about alternatives to college that people don't see. Um, having a living wage, being able to start a family, being able to think about 
family as a partnership that helps build the future instead of it's the old cornerstone capstone thing where instead of right now we're busy saying okay now I'm ready to have a family I have a career I have an education I have this and that but I think it's opening the door for people to have different pathways and to kind of choose what kind of family life they want as part of their aspiration instead of saying once I get everything else figured out then I'm going to figure out my family life I, I just think we really have to emphasize that uh, Valerie, sort of looking internationally, are there any countries that we should be emulating and and copying social programs or financial programs or or any other sort of who 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 is not having this dire conversation right now and what can we what can we glean from them? Well, I think everyone, <laughs> certainly every developed nation is having the yeah. same conversation right now. There's there's no exceptions, right? If you look at the list of, of uh, fertility rate of countries, there's no developed country that has um, a um, above replacement um, birth rate. So I think these conversations are going on all over the world, and they're going on in places like Iran, right? Which is, uh, you know, deathly afraid that its falling birth rate will compromise its geopolitical position. So there's there's just so much going on. But uh, you know, I really think that uh, while social support can help, uh, you know, France managed to just nudge its birth rate up with uh, incredible social support and so forth. It's not going to get you, <laughs> you know, above replacement again. It's just not going to do it. Um, and so while I am a, a firm supporter of paid family leave for families in America, it's just still stunning. I mean, I have international students in my classes every semester. And when they discover that the US doesn't have paid maternity leave, they're like, how is this possible? How Physically. <laughs> yeah, this is just, you know, it just blows their mind, right? Yeah. We're still in this bizarre situation. So um, I, I am certainly in favor of social support. I'm in favor of uh, uh, tax uh, reform um, that favors family. Uh, I'm not quite as far as economist Shirley Burgraff, who said, look, you've just got to tie social security to the income of the children produced. Voila, you'll get more children. And I don't think we are, are, are ever going to go the path of China, which is now thinking about, are you ready for this? Birth quotas, birth quotas for women. After so they went from birth caps to birth quotas. Right. So now we can go from forcibly inserting IUDs into women to forcibly removing IUDs from women in China. It's just absolutely insane. But uh, to go back to a previous point, um, you know, I really, <laughs> I really do think that the, uh, if you will, the sexual contract between men and women is going to have to be renegotiated. And how that happens, I don't know. Right. Certainly, as Lyman pointed out, there's various different communities that have taken different approaches to the sexual contract. Um, and certainly, um, I think that, uh, you know, the, the larger issue of things like uh, pornography, right, will have to be um, part of the discussion, even though people would like to remove it from the discussion. I think the actual terms on which women are conceiving children, right, has got to be part of the discussion. So I there agree a, with that very I, much. Oh, yeah, sorry. I just want to say there was a fantastic piece in The Atlantic about that two years ago that has never left my brain. Um, so I just wanted to throw that in. But please, I'm going to go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, some kind of renegotiation of what family looks like, I think, is, first of all, an inevitability. That is, this is always happening. Uh, tradition is always being recreated. Um, uh, and at the same time, I think it's interesting to observe the different tensions at work here. That on the one hand, we point at somewhere like Japan or Korea, and we say that this model of marriage is, it seems very unfair to women. Okay. Um, that's totally reasonable. That makes sense to me. Um, but then on the other hand, uh, if we look at something like my arguments about workism, um, we have to ask, well, why is that model of marriage unfair to women in Japan? Well, it's because women in Japan also want careers and careers in Japan aren't compatible with what the Japanese marriage norm is. 
right? Um, particularly for women. Um, in which case say, okay, so is it the family model that should change? Or is or are Japanese careers perfectly normal and the Japanese family model is weird? Or is it the Japanese family model is actually not that unusual, but Japanese careers are unusual. And by the way, it turns out it's the careers that are unusual, right? Their working hours per week are like, tw are, are like 60 hours a week. Um, uh, and they have a two-tier labor market where, right, if you're, if you're not a salary man, you basically have no employment security, no benefits, no nothing. But if you're, if, once you kind of make that jump to what's called standardized employment, you're essentially unfireable, have an excellent wage, um, but, you know, you got to log all this face time. Um, I think often we, when we think about sort of the renegotiation of the social contract between the couples, I think it's important to keep in mind that actually that type of thing tends to be the last thing to change. So if we look for our solutions from, we're going to try and get everybody to change their ideas about gender and marriage, we're going to fail. Um, because that, that just, that's very slow. Secondarily, I think often we don't always understand what people's eyes, ideas and values actually are. So for example, men in my generation are astronomically more likely to use pornography than men in any previous generation and use it more frequently. We're also vastly less likely to cheat on our wives. We're less likely to use prostitutes. Um, and we are less likely to have a large number of premarital sexual partners. So did men in my generation become less marriageable? Or did they become more marriageable? And that's going to depend Basically on being less marriageable, to be perfectly honest with you. No well, one wants to be the recipient of the kinds of behavior that they see in porn. Do you know that there's actually countries now that have had to pass laws that suggest that killing someone while strangling them during sex is not a defense? I can tell you from the ground, Lyman, that the girls that I speak with are very, very unwilling to enter into these kinds of relationships. I totally get that. I do, I understand that. At the same time, about 40% of porn users are women. So again, I think that pointing, pointing to this problem as like, this is a marriageable men problem, every generation will identify reasons why the other sex is very bad. Like I just, this is humanity. The war of the sexes goes to the beginning, okay? Um, uh, it is, you look in Genesis and they blame each other, right? Um, this, is, this is not new. Um, and while I think porn use is terrible, I think it has all these bad effects. Yes, agreed. I do think when we think about what is the renegotiation that's going to happen, first of all, I think we have to have a little bit of humility that we don't necessarily always know what the problems are. Um, for, for example, Porn use, it's a bad thing. Okay, but why did it increase? Well, it's because porn use got free and online. Well, okay, so then is the solution, is the issue that men became worse? Or is the issue that we just need to put an excise tax on porn? Um, that is maybe it's the exact same merit, uh, moral quality manifesting in different situations, right? Which is to say, when we think about cultural change, going to be very complicated, it's going to be very hard, and it's going to be almost impossible to, to affect in a sort of liberal pluralist system. That is, you're not gonna be able to centrally from Washington DC enact a cultural change. I don't think anyone- Which is why it's important to think about policy. Yeah, I, I really do think you're right, but I think if you're looking to social support to um, significantly affect these birth rates, you're barking up the wrong tree. So in essence, I think your position comes down to is that there is no solution and that we will end up like Japan one day. And I'm on board with that. I think that's probably what will happen. I don't think we need to fool ourselves that some sort of um, policy wand can be waved from Washington and prevent us from getting to Japan. I don't think it's possible. No, I, I don't think that's correct. So first of all, I do think it's plausible we might end up like Japan, totally plausible. But when we say like a child allowance, for example, it will cost anywhere from $200,000 to a million dollars of total program spending per additional child you incentivize to be born with a child allowance, which means to get to replacement rate fertility, you'd have to spend anywhere from 250 billion to $1 trillion per year in a child allowance. That's not happening. Agreed, that's not plausible. We might still wanna have a bit more of a child allowance for a variety of reasons, 
but we're not going to get to replacement just that way. On the other hand, when the Bank of England eased interest rates during the Great Recession, they did so in a way that specifically translated those interest rates directly into some homeowners' mortgages. That is, instead of doing it just through a policy rate only available to banks, they did it through a policy rate that also directly impacted some mortgages. This impacted the monthly mortgage payments that families had. Dollar for dollar, it only cost about $5,000 for every extra baby born. That is in terms of the total amount of interest being paid, which is to say there are leverage points. They aren't all direct fiscal transfers. Housing costs are a really important leverage point. This is something that we can fix through regulations, which cost zero dollars. That is, we can directly attack the zoning rules that make housing expensive. You can also think about things like care costs. Um, why, do, why does care cost so much? Well, some of it is because of the rising regulatory cost of care. So when we think about policy, don't think we should just think about social support. Social support is an important part of policy, but in fact, there are magic wands we can wave in state, national, county courthouses, all that, um, that will have large effects. So, mean, it requires multiple and, policies. And yet we have never policies. seen that happen. We have never seen that happen. So I'm I'm yeah. going to be an optimist. The birth rate went from below the Canadian average to 0.2 children above it in about four years, directly and coordinated that does, policy. We've never seen a sub-replacement birth rate pop up over again with those kinds of- The Republic of Georgia did it from 2007 to 2012, so really a series of both religious interventions and a large- Not you where you want to go. And I, I, I'm glad for every one of those interventions, and yet it will still not get you where you want to go. So what happens to hope? And I'm not talking about some, some goofy sort of, man, we can wish this away, but I, everything that Lyman's talking about is things that give families hope that they can afford to have a child. And, and having a child is a really aspirational thing too. You are placing all your hope in the fact that you'll be able to raise this child and afford this child and give this child a good future and be a good parent. All those things that he's talking about are things that play into that, that I'll be able to feed them, that I'll be able to take care of them, that I'll be able to do whatever. And that has to be part of the picture too, because I can't help but feel that part of what's happening with fertility is that people feel discouraged and like they're not quite sure. They feel uncertain about the future and they're not willing to invest in having children. And I think that, I don't know how you solve that. I don't know how you go that, you know, there's no happy pill, but I really do think that we have to look at hopeful things that kind of change that cultural projection. But if Lyman's uh, analysis is correct, it's not necessarily about hope. It's about where you find your meaning. And if you find your meaning in work, then children will always encumber you. And they may not be rational from that point of view. So I think it's it's more than hope. It's what you want too. So I, I wanted to sort of wrap up our conversation and, um, and, and, and thank you all for all of your insights. This was a really wonderful, spirited, great, somewhat depressing um, <laughs> conversation about where, where we are and where we're going. And I wanted, before we did wrap up, if, if anyone has sort of any final thoughts about this, this entire sort of topic in general, um, I wanted to give you the opportunity sort of to just have that final word. And, and Lois, maybe hope was your final word. I don't know. What, what are you thinking about sort of your, your final thoughts on this, on this topic and conversation? I'm thinking about probably three things. One is how we change the message. Um, there's a lot of divisiveness and a lot of discontent that I think spreads down to other areas. And I think that, um, I think that hope is a big part of that. I hope that we can, can move forward in ways that are helpful and that we can get past some of the politics of the discussion um, on what works and what doesn't work. I'm also thinking about the fact that if each of us would would think a little bit more about what does the future hold for schools? Will schools, will we not have schools? Will we, will only the elite be able to go to college because we won't have that many colleges? Will only this happen or that happen? Then I think that people are maybe more apt to change sort of the workist attitude a bit and think, because like I said, I am workist, but I'm also familist. So what does that make me? Does that make me an anomaly? 
because I've tried to put 100% into both. Um, I think that you can't have it all, but you can sure try. And maybe if we try, we'll get somewhere. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Valerie, what, do you have any sort of final thoughts on where, uh, on this entire topic in general, either where we are, or where we're going? Sure. Yeah, I think that this is, uh, this issue is actually an issue that um, has seized um, the governments of the world. I think um, that, that this is one of those huge, huge megatrends um, that you don't see on the front page of the New York Times every day, and yet is going to shape every facet of our lives. And I think uh, every good idea, whether it be a policy intervention into interest rates, or uh, whether it be you know, something uh, uh, along the lines of, of redefining where we find our meaning, um, which I think is, is also something that happens on a generational basis. All of these things, I think, have to be um, in play. Um, and I think the fate of nations really does hinge upon uh, what I've called in my own books, the first political order. That is the political order that arises from sexual difference and um, the meaning that that sexual difference has for reproduction. So you can't get around questions of, of, of who men are, who women are, who fathers are, who mothers are, if you're gonna solve the trap, and I do believe it is a trap, of uh, spiraling sub-replacement birth rates. Thank you. Lyman, do you have any final thoughts on this before we close out? Sure, I think the first thing I'd say is just, there's actually a, a significant agreement uh, here that I think is not heavily remarked on. That is, um, for various reasons in various ways, we all pretty much see this as a significant social problem. Um, it's a real problem that policymakers really need to find a way to be talking about in a way that is useful, helpful, and productive. Um, and there's probably not enough talk about it, or at least not enough useful talk about it. Um, so I think that that's the first place of agreement is that this is a real problem. It's not something we can just ignore. More and more governments are coming around to recognize this problem. And I think the US needs to uh, do so in a more explicit and intentional way. As far as what to do about it, Valerie's right that we don't have a single magic wand that we can point to eight or nine good test cases from other places where they were super successful. Um, there's a lot that we don't know about what's causing low fertility and what can be done about it. But there are some things that we do know. We do know that increases in social support directly for families cause increases in the birth rate. They're not extremely large. And the cost to get to replacement exclusively through that, through that strategy is prohibitive. However, we also know that there are other factors that also influence the birth rate that are sometimes policy amenable. Things like working hours and working conditions, things like the duration of education, things like the cost of housing. These are all areas where policymakers can take actions that don't necessarily have large budgetary costs. In combination with more generous social supports, these policies can make a real difference. Is it going to get us to replacement? Maybe not. Could it get us an extra few hundred thousand human beings and American citizens every year? Quite possibly, yes. I think that's worth doing even if we don't technically get to 2.08. Human life is worth it even when it is below replacement. <laughs> so what I would say is, this is a real problem. There are things that can be done about it. They might not get us to exactly the place we want to be. They can get us closer. And so they are worth doing. Thank you so much. And I, I just wanted to thank all of you again for coming to this Deseret News event. This was a, a fantastic conversation. I really appreciate all of you taking the time to share your expertise with our, our viewers and readers and listeners. Thank you so much.